to some bodies. If you have ever struggled with people pleasing, this is about to change. If you have ever struggled with comparing yourself to others, something's about to change in you. If you have ever struggled with low self-esteem, something is about to change on the inside of you. I came to remind you that he made you fearfully and wonderfully, put you on this planet intentionally, not by happenstance, not by circumstance. He designed you a certain way, wired you a certain way, literally called you based on your personality, your skill set, your giftings, your disposition, so that you could be a reflection of his glory in the earth. And so uh, I'm, I'm coming at it from a very... Um, what I would refer to as a unique perspective because this particular parable is in the Old Testament. It would be so easy to do something from the New Testament around this, but there's a parable in the Old Testament found in Judges chapter number 9. I invite you to visit me and join me there. Judges chapter number 9, verses 7 through 15. To me, this is one of the most profound parables in the entire Old Testament. I want to give you some background to it. If not, it just seems like um, you've walked into a movie theater when the movie is already in 48 minutes and you don't know what the context is. So let me give you the context. Uh, this is still the narrative of Gideon and his offspring. Gideon, that mighty man that we're introduced to in Judges chapter number six that uh, is used by God. Uh, he himself had low self-esteem. He himself felt like he could not be used. He was used by God modestly. And at the end of chapter number eight, Gideon comes home. After uh, defeating the uh, Midianites, he comes home. When he comes home, he starts a family. Now, you know the Old Testament has zero chill in the way that they describe what happens in the Old Testament. He had a lot of children. Let me tell you how many children he had, 70. He had many wives. He sired 70 children. Scripture says he had many wives and he had 70 children with those wives. And then it says he also had a concubine. This makes zero sense to me. Who has many wives and still needs a side chick? So he has 70 children with his wives and then he has a child with the side chick. And when their father, Gideon, dies, also called Jerubael, when the father dies, the son of the side chick goes to his side of the family and says, isn't it better that one rule instead of all of these children? Do you want to be ruled by 70 children or just one? And he gets his side of the family to side with him. And then they hire some very, very... Uh, 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 violent men I'll say it that way and these violent men come and they kill what they think are all 70 children of Gideon they thought it was all 70 but one got away his name was Jotham and Jotham runs to my Mount Gerizim and stands there and gives this parable I'm about to read. I wanted you to have context before I read it. So out of 70 brothers, he's the last one left. And the son of the concubine now has to hear from the child who he thought was dead. Here is what he says, starting at verse number seven. When Jotham heard about this, he climbed to the top of Mount Gerizim and shouted, listen to me, citizens of Shechem, listen if you want God to listen to you. Once upon a time, that's just hilarious to me, that it starts like a Disney theme. Once upon a time, the trees decided to choose a king. First they said to the olive tree, be our king. But the olive tree refused. He saying, should I quit producing the oil, the olive oil that blesses both God and people just to wave back and forth over the trees? 
Then, he said to the, then they said to the fig tree, you be our king. But the fig tree also refused, saying, should I quit producing my sweet fruit just to wave back and forth over the trees? Then they said to the grapevine, you be our king. But the grapevine also refused, saying, should I quit producing the wine that cheers both God and people just to wave back and forth over the trees? Then all the trees finally turned to the thorn bush and said, come, you be our king. And the thorn bush replied to the trees, if you truly want to make me your king, come and take shelter in my shade. If not, let the fire come out of me and devour the cedars of Lebanon. If you're taking notes on this message, four words, please God, not people. Please, God, not people. Bow your heads. Let's pray over the word, shall we? Holy Spirit, help us to please God. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. As I forestated, this to me is one of the most uh, profound parables in the entire Old Testament because of its implications, because of what Jotham says, he is able to calibrate the families around this thought that the character of the person that they have chosen to be king is not the character and the integrity of the type of person that their father was. Although their father was not perfect, He was indeed God's choice. And because God chose him, everything that Gideon did was successful. But when you choose yourself, when you volunteer that I can do this and try to get God to co-sign on it, things go horribly bad. I refer to this as godly ambition. Godly ambition is, to me, the most, fang- the most dangerous form of ambition. Godly ambition, to me, by definition, is when you choose to do something for God that he never said he wanted to do through you. It's when we volunteer to, to select ourselves as God's ambassador for something and God's like, I, I, I didn't ask you to do that. I was at church for 20 hours because I'm serving the Lord. And the Lord's like, I wish you would have left at eight and loved your spouse. I was interceding for the Lord until 5 a.m., but you were late to work that you should have been at at 9 a.m. We ask God to put so much into what we want to do for him. Instead of just sitting to, to reflect upon what he wants to do through us. In this particular parable, what I found so profound is the implications that it has for us present day. That even though we're not wrestling with uh, the issues that Jotham had with his brother Abimelech based on the death of his father, the parable rings true for all of us. That we have to make a decision as to whether we are going to be comfortable being who God called us to be. Or if we will spend our lives chasing titles because we never grew secure enough to accept the assignment that he had for us. Jotham's parable starts off by saying, once upon a time, there were some trees who decided to choose a king. 
And the trees went to the olive tree, and they said to the olive tree, we want you to be our king. And the olive tree said, should I quit producing my olives? That produce the oil that no Pentecostal church can live without? <laughs> you, you want me to stop producing the olives that go in every Greek salad from here all the way back to Macedonia? You, you want me to stop producing what I was created and put on the earth to produce just to look like and act like the king you want me to be? He, he actually did it with a little more, with, with a little more emphasis. He said, you want me to give up being who I am to do this? You want me to stop being who God created me to be so that I can wave back and forth in front of you? Try to help somebody in here. The olive tree said, who I am is more important than the title that you want to bestow upon me. I'd rather stay an olive tree and not be noticed for by anybody that doesn't like olive oil that doesn't like Greek salads, I'd rather just be that person than to take your title as king but have no more fruit. I'm going to help somebody in here. The olive tree said, you could never get me to give up who I am to act like something I am not. Because the olive tree is just secure being an olive tree. The trees are dejected. Who wouldn't want to be a king? Let me, let me find somebody. You know what? I know who we can ask. Let's ask that, let's ask that, fig, that fig tree. Don't nobody like no figs like that. Figs ain't getting that kind of shine. I understand the olive is popping like that. Rachel Ray uses it in all her cooking. Extra virgin olive oil, cold press, first press. We get it. A lot of people cook with it. Okay, it's popular. Let's go look for somebody not as popular. Let's go find somebody that shouldn't even be comfortable with who they are because they're not as popular as the olive tree. Because, you know, that fig tree, it ain't popping like that. I mean, around Christmas, somebody might have some figgy pudding. And there's about 22 people that still buy fig Newtons. But overall, ain't nobody messing with no fig tree. So they skip over to the fig tree. What's up, fig? You my fig. You good? What you doing today? Chilling? Man, we want you to be our king. You know what that good old fig tree said? Who only got 802 people following them on Instagram? You know what that fig said? Who only got 500 friends on Facebook? You know what that fig said? Who only has 11 followers on Twitter? That fig said, should I quit producing my sweet fruit just to wave back and forth in front of y'all? See, I'm trying to tell somebody you can get to a place of security within yourself that even though you may not appeal to everybody, you are so comfortable in your own skin, you're not comparing yourself to anybody else. You're not trying to be like anybody else you are okay with you 
That fig tree said, I produce sweet fruit. I'm good over here. Now, I'm only really popular around the holidays. But let me tell you something. I'm good. Thank you, Holy Spirit. It's only popular around the holidays in America. Figs are popular in the Middle East and in the Mediterranean. And what you have to understand, sometimes you got to understand there is a people for me. There is a group for me. There is a community for me. I don't fit with everybody. I don't belong in every circle. But the places that I do go, I am accepted. The places that I do go, I am valuable. The places that he has me go, they appreciate what's on the inside of me. I know I'm not everybody's cup of tea. But I am somebody's. They couldn't believe it. Them trees said, I, we just knew the fig tree. Went. Let's go ask Grapevine. Let's go, let's go see what Grapevine doing. They went up to the Grapevine. Grapevine! What's up, fam? You look a little clustered. <laughs> Flustered, but clustered. Never, never mind. It's in my head. I'm not as funny outwardly as I think I am inwardly. Um, you look a little clustered. Would you be our king? Grapevine said. <gasps> I'm shocked. I'm appalled by your request. Do you actually think, and I love what scripture says here, I'm not going to try to advocate nothing, but I'm going to just read what the scripture said. He said, do you think I would actually stop producing the wine that cheers both God and man? I didn't say it, Bible did. Good to know God has a drink. Not trying to disturb anybody theologically, it's just saying the Bible said... That joker said, I don't just cheer people. I cheer God. Okay, so that's what he said. That's what the Bible said. I didn't say that. He says, should, should I stop producing the grape that when pressed produces the juice, that when fermented produces the wine, that cheers both God and man to accept your title? Just to look like I'm doing something? Can I just stop right here for at least 120 seconds and say I'm tired of people walking around looking like they're doing something but don't have no fruit on their tree? They're not bearing no fruit. Y'all busy? Y'all grinding? Y'all moving around but ain't no fruit coming off the tree? You handing out business cards with more commas than you have fruit. I'm an author, a speaker, a, 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 I do a podcast, I also do real estate on the side, I, I started a food truck, and, and, and none of them are going, what? You haven't sold a hundred books, you can't cook that good, Nobody's motivated by your speaking. It's time to cut off all this stuff and just produce the fruit that God has called you to produce. Grapes don't produce figs. Figs don't produce olives. Be happy with the tree that he made you to be. <laughs> Pastor John came up here in an all-black suit arm high up in a sling, stood in front of this microphone and gave us a Phantom of the Opera-esque. I am right in front of him. This man can preach and sing? and prophesy, and this and that. You know what I'm doing on the front row? That's my brother. 
handle your business. This song is taking me into the throne room. This song is putting me in the presence of God. Here's what I'm not doing. How come I can't sing? Maybe I should do a solo before I preach, because, I mean, he did something, so I should do something. No, no, no. That's the fruit on his tree, and I'm happy for the fruit that is on his tree, and he is happy for the fruit that is on my tree. I'm trying to release some people in here. You do not have to be what everybody wants you to be. You do not have to do what everybody wants you to do. You are free to be who God has called you to be. I can't tell you how many preachers are in churches right now because somebody said you should be a preacher. Not because God said they were supposed to be a preacher. Because somebody looked at him and said, you got a bishop's neck. I don't even know what a bishop's neck is. But somewhere out there, somebody is judging necks and literally equating that to a calling. And they're putting people in situations where they're going to fail and not thrive. So now we got 250 churches within a three square mile radius. And they all got 22 members each. When the person should be the regional manager of a call center and making six figures, they are now asking the church for another $100 to put in the plate because there's no fruit coming out of you, sir. You're a prophetess and none of your prophecies have come true. Old Testament would have stoned you. New Testament has grace. Just go be the bank teller and secure somebody's first home loan and prophesy that a generational blessing is going to happen because they just find, you just helped them finance the house. You're, but you know, you're not an evangelist. No one wants you to evangel. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, somebody tell somebody this. I don't know who this is for. I'm just sitting in it, and you got to figure it out. Uh, some of y'all need to just get off social media. Hear me, hear me. Okay, I'll refine it. Some of y'all need to unfollow some people that you keep comparing yourself to. Some of y'all have some unhealthy follows. Because every time they pop up in your, in your timeline, you, you, you're not there to, like, celebrate what they're doing something hits you in the pit of your stomach where you, you, you start feeling some type of way. How come she and not me? They just came back from vacation. We can't go nowhere. That person was now featured on that album. This person didn't even call me back from my own. Unfollow. Just accept the fact that you were fig. Everybody ain't going to be an olive tree. Some people are figs. Everybody ain't going to be no grapevine. Some of y'all just a peach tree. Peaches are amazing. I need the cobbler. If you stop being a peach, we won't have no cobbler. You see what I'm talking about? Uh, apple pies sell more throughout the year. How come I can't get no apples on this branch? Because it's not who he called you to be. All right. So, so, so I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a Bible dude. So let, let me give you some teaching right through here, and then we out. So this is, uh, this is I want to give you three points. Just write these down, because I, I want you to be able to anchor this when you, when you leave. Uh, Point number one, never choose a title or a position over a calling. This, this is what I want you to leave with. Never choose a title or a position over a calling. Here's what it says in John chapter number six, verses 14 and 15. And this is about Jesus. When the people saw him do this miraculous sign, they exclaimed, surely he is the prophet that we have been expecting. When Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be their king, he slipped away into the hills by himself. 
Jesus said, I can't take your title in your timing. I'm supposed to be king, but you can't make me the king. Only God can make me the king. So scripture says, when they would crown him to be king, he ran away from it. Some of us are running to stuff that we need to run away from. Every open door is not an open door from God. I know I'm way over in South Carolina, but I'm from California, Southern California. It's still an SC. It's just not the SC that this SC is SC. Uh, but in Southern California, uh, where I'm from in the hood, we play dominoes. And in dominoes, sometimes you lift up and you're like, oh, I'm about to run this whole board. But we have a saying in dominoes that all money ain't good money. That you could score and you can make some points here or you could forego that score and lock up the whole game. So all money ain't good money, ain't good money. And every open door is not an open door from God. Yeah. Trying to help somebody. Oh, this open door is going to advance my ministry. Not if immorality is on the other side. Yeah. This open door is going to promote, give me a promotion in my career. Not if compromise of your character is on the other side. Oh, this door is going to allow me to do so much more things. Not if you are no longer being the person you were created to be. See, I have lived free in ministry for 28 years because through the leading of the Holy Spirit, not my own wise movements or, 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 or sound judgment, but every time I was ready to do something and the Holy Spirit would tap me on the shoulder and say, don't do that. And when y'all, when I tell you it look good, I was like, it's going to be popping over there. He said, don't go in there. I was like, but they going in there. He was like, mm, -mm. They are, but you not. And so I didn't go in there. And because I didn't go in there, I'm not, I can't even say like six months later, the whole thing blew up. No, because I didn't go in there, I got to keep producing the fruit that God called me to produce. Point number two, please write this down. Never choose a title or position over production. Hear me on this. Luke chapter number four, verses 16 through 21. When he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the scriptures. The scroll of Isaiah, the prophet, was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where this was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. He rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, and sat down. All eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently. Then he began to speak to them. The scripture you've just heard has been fulfilled this very day. Listen. Jesus goes into the synagogue. He reads Isaiah 61, and then he says, what I just read is the fruit I'm going to produce for my entire earthly ministry. And for the next three and a half years, you can look through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and what you will find Jesus doing can slot into one of the five things he said he was going to do in his earthly ministry. I want you to become so comfortable with the skill set God has put on the inside of you that you can boldly declare when you walk in, here's what I have to offer, and here is how it's going to be a benefit and blessing to your life. That's not arrogance. That's not even confidence. That's called fact. This is either the most arrogant moment of Jesus' earthly ministry, or it's just factual. I mean, to sit up and read from Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he has anointed me to do this, 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 and this, and then sit down, and everybody looking at him like, what you talking about? And he said, oh, what I just read has been fulfilled in your hearing. That's me. He cocky. He too conceited. Mm -mm. Or maybe he's just sure Let me tell you what type of, ha let me tell you what happens to the atmosphere when you walk in certain. 
You ever seen somebody walk into a room and produce more anxiety than they produce calm, calmness? Because they walk in, hey, hey, y'all. <laughs> Hi. Amen. Y'all pray for me. Flight was long. I ate something bad last night. My stomach kind of queasy. Uh, y'all, y'all open your Bibles to uh, Judges 9 and God put something on my heart. I'm going to just try my best, saints. Y'all just pray. Some of y'all might be like, this going to be less than 100 minutes. <laughs> this might not even make it to 60. But it's different when you walk in a room and say, hey, y'all can all calm down. I'm here. And I have a skill set in this area that's going to produce structure, that's going to produce clarity. And we're going to see a pathway forward. And I promise you, in the next 90 minutes, we're going to all be okay. Then you like, either, okay. I mean, I don't know him, but he seems sure. So we're going to go with it. When I started this message, I told you, if you struggle with low self-esteem, if you struggle with people pleasing, if you struggle with comparison, at the end of this message, this is something that's going to change in your life. I didn't say that because I was like, Lord, please do it. Every time I preach this message, somebody gets free from low self-esteem. Every time I preach this message, somebody breaks the spirit of comparison off of their life. Every time I preach this message, they stop people-pleasing and they start putting up boundaries to say, even though you want me to do it, I'm not doing it. I'm not comfortable. That's not my skin. Sorry. Judges chapter 9 told me I'm an olive tree. It's funny when you leave a church service and you use an analogy during the week that nobody has context to. <laughs> hey, man, we want to promote you to the general manager over this whole thing, and you're like, I'm a fig! <laughs> Whoa, hey. Calm down, fam. I, what? I am a fig! I can't be the general manager of nothing! I'm a fig! Call the grapes. <laughs> the grapes? Ramirez, call Ramirez. He's a whole cluster. He can get it done. I am a fig. You just save your life knowing who you are. There's been some conferences. We want you to come. Oh, we've seen your podcast, and we've known about your ministry, and, and we want you to come to the conference. It's going to be a prophetic conference. And we want you to come in and declare and be one of the prophets that sit and, and like, and I was like, oh, no, 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 oh, no. No, yeah, you don't want me to do that. Uh-uh, that thing ain't on me like that. Mm -mm, I don't, I don't, mm -mm, mm -mm. That sounds oily. That sounds... What you, you, that's the oily thing you talking about there. You're going to need a lot of olives <laughs> pressed to prophesy for three days and be accurate for everybody. Um, I'm more grapish. I'm more sommelier. I'm more red. Mine is more of a <laughs> vino rojo. I, I'm more... It's not, that's not the way I really get that. But when it literally keeps you from embarrassing yourself. Imagine me taking it for money or taking it for, for, for popularity or taking it for prestige. And then I get in there and everybody going to find out anyway. Oh, he ain't oily. We shouldn't have brought him. He looked oily. He's grapish. He's more. Point number three, please write this down. Never choose a title or position over results. Don't choose it over calling. Don't choose it over production. And don't choose a title or position. I'd rather be titled less for the rest of my life than to have a title that doesn't accurately describe me. When I, when I was the, uh, and I'm not saying this to, to start no revolution uh, uh, up in here, but when I was the lead pastor of Embassy City Church, nobody on staff or the congregation called me Pastor Tim. And the reason why they didn't call me Pastor Tim is because pastoring is what I do. It's not who I am. Pastor is a verb. It's an action word. I do pastoring. I'm also an apostle. I establish churches and I oversee churches. 
That's, that's what I do. It's not who I am. If Usain Bolt walked in here right now or ran, we wouldn't see him and say, Sprinter Usain. His name is Usain. And he runs. If Michael, Phelps, if Michael Phelps walked in here right now, we wouldn't be like, Swimmer Mike. We would be like, that's Mike. He swims. The noun is supposed to come before the verb. I, Paul, an apostle. I'm trying to help somebody. I'll take it back to the Bible if you need it. I, Paul, an apostle. This is who I am. This is what I do. Jesus was given a name that was above all names. And at that name, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess some things in the earth, above the earth, and under the earth. He wasn't given a title. We have no authority in the Rose of Sharon. We have no authority in the Great Emmanuel. We have no authority in the Wonderful Council. We have no authority in Jehovah Jireh. Demons don't flee at Jehovah Rophah. They flee at the name of Yeshua. He was given a name. And that name has produced fruit. And that fruit is us. And that fruit is supposed to permeate the entire earth. Let me get this last thing out. I, I promise I'll, I'll be done. Never choose a title of results. Matthew 11, 18 and 19. Here's what it says. For John didn't spend his time eating and drinking. And you say he's possessed by a demon. The son of man, on the other hand, feasts and drinks, and you say he's a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and other sinners. Here it is right here. But wisdom is proven to be right or shown to be right by its results. Sometimes the only way you know if the decision was right or wrong is to let some time go by. Sometime in the moment, you'll never, you won't get the revelation of, God, did I make the right decision or did I make the wrong decision? Sometimes you got to let some time pass. They were misjudging the fruit of both John the Baptist and Jesus' ministries because it looked like it didn't belong where it was. So they said, John definitely had a demon. And you are definitely a sinner because of who you hang with. And Jesus said, hey, wisdom is proven to be right, right by its results. So here it is 2,000 years later. The results are clear. Jesus was right. <laughs> they dead and gone. But Jesus was right. There is fruit that he has called you to produce that has been withering on your vine, on your limbs, on your branches, all because you haven't got over what somebody else said you should be. All because you haven't got over what somebody else said you should do. I'll end with a story of a, a, a young man that I know. He's one of the most brilliant photographers in the United States of America, halfway around the world. He, when, you, when you're a photographer and people hire you to fly to their country to take a picture of their mountain, you're probably a good photographer, right? Um, so he was at a church, and the lead pastor said, man, I don't see you around here enough. You, you need to be a deacon here. And so he came to me, and he was like, man, my pastor said he don't see me enough because I'll be on assignments doing the photography stuff. And he told me I should be a deacon here. I said, man, I'm not going to tell you to go against your pastor. But I will tell you to check your fruit. The gift he gave you to take pictures takes you around the world, puts you in rooms with people that you get to share the gospel to that you would never be able to share the gospel to if you were a deacon here. So all I'm asking is, are you going to be the most picture takingest deacon of all time? Or would you have to stop producing the fruit that God called you to produce to go be this person's deacon? And just because your pastor told you, don't mean God did. John and Aventura are not God. I am not God. None of these pastors are God. We serve God. 
and we can see gifts and talents. But you got to hit your knees and pray. Is what they see in me lining up with the assignment they've just invited me into? Don't give up your fruit to do this. Everyone standing. I want to pray for some people that just want to snap that people pleasing, that want to snap that spirit of comparison, that want to break off that low self-esteem so you can be free in your own skin. I don't know if somebody pronounced a word curse on you, if they said you were never going to be something and it's made your fruit wither up, but you don't have to leave the same way you came. And so if this message has been for you, I just want you to come. I just want to pray for you. No matter where you are, if you're saying, you know what, I've been a people pleaser. It's hard for me to say no. I don't want to hurt somebody else's feelings. No, no, no. This is not about hurting feelings. This is about keeping your sanity. And listen, I know it to be true because I used to be a people pleaser. It was hard for me to tell people no, but I can't tell you how much resentment and bitterness built up in me because I, every time I said yes, I was, I was tearing off a piece of my own boundary to please somebody else instead of producing the fruit that God taught, called me to produce. Yeah, y'all coming. Keep coming. Wherever you are. There's freedom in the house today. Woo! There's freedom in the house today. This is about to, you are about to embark on the greatest fruit producing seasons of your entire life. You are going to be more you than you've ever been. Doing more of you, what you were created to do than you've ever done. All because you've received this message. Come on, can we praise God for all of these trees? <laughs>